glad you could join me again today. We're going to talk about the spice of study. A study doesn't really sound like much of a spice, does it? Matter of fact, Ecclesiastes says that much study is the weariness of the flesh. And if you've ever been to college or spent much time studying, you know it does really uh, work on your energy level as well. So why in the world would we want to add this type of spice to our spiritual life? Well, here's the reason. Because without study, you're going to go hungry. You really are. Study is how mature Christians feed themselves. And the Bible describes it as meat and bread and milk. And so we need the sustenance that's provided by adding scriptural truth and understanding into our lives if we're going to face the challenges ahead and if we're going to continue to grow in Christ. So a daily diet, you know, of... Um, picking up a little devotion book or having five minutes of prayer or even five minutes of meditation and one minute of waiting of God is really not enough to help you to grow in your spiritual life. It's just not sufficient. Even going to church one hour or listening to the live stream is not going to be enough to keep you spiritually healthy. You have to learn how to prepare meals for yourself. You've got to learn to feed yourself. And there are lots of ways to do that. So Today I'm going to list for you several different ways to study, and if one captures your imagination, then you know, grab hold of it, jot it down, and give it a try. If you've never tried to study your Bible, this is a good time because we're still having some restrictions, we're still facing things, and you can dig you, yourself out some wonderful encouragement in God's Word if you will take time. So here's some different ways that you can study your Bible. First of all, you can study it devotionally, and that just means reading and taking time to consider what you're, what you're reading, and a lot of people use this method. To do this, you just read through and you think through what you're reading. Read it as if it's being written especially to you. If you're reading in the New Testament, read it like a letter. That's what many of the epistles are. They're just letters written to someone. Read it in a very personal way and look and see what you can draw out of it. Look for instructions to follow or promises to claim. Look for uh, sins that you need to forsake. Just look and see what the verses are saying personally and directly to you. And this method goes really great with journaling where you can then write down what you've learned and keep a spiritual diary. And then above all, learn to obey what you read. Make application. Another way to study is for knowledge, and this has a variety of ways. You can study by chapters and paragraphs. If your Bible has that little mark that indicates the paragraphs, you can study by verse. And with this mode, you can look into increase your knowledge so that you really understand maybe the layout of the tabernacle or the laws of the Levit in Leviticus. You look at something specific and really study it out for knowledge. You make yourself some notes and then you dig in so that you can understand and you do the research that's necessary. Another way you can study is by book. And there's different ways to approach this. You can do what we call an inductive study. And that means taking the details, drawing out some outlines, making application. That's the way preachers uh, put together their sermons many times. Another way inside this is called synthetic. It's where you just read a book to get the general impression, the, really the idea of what the writer is saying, and, and uh, just to get maybe like the flavor the flavor of that book. I know there's certain books that have a special flavor. The book of James is a beautiful book on just common sense. Just common sense Christian living makes a great study. Another way you can study books is by historical. So you look at the book in relation to how it falls into the timeline. So like, for example, if you're reading the Minor Prophets, you look and see where they fall in the timeline of the children of Israel, and then you get to see a better picture of how the Bible all weaves together. Another way to study is by biography, where you pick out a Bible character and you read all you can about them. You maybe get some other books from other people and read what they've written, and you draw some conclusions about their life, wise decisions, poor decisions, consequences, how they dealt with sin in their life, different ways, and you draw from that person and get some ideas on how you can uh, develop your life as well. And then you always want to make sure that when you're studying that you corroborate what you're finding with Scripture. It's very important that no matter what you study, that you remember that it must match with Scripture. So be very careful that way. Another way to study is by topic. 
And what you do is you choose a topic, maybe Bible prayers or songs or marriage or tithing, whatever, a certain topic, and you do some research with that. And you might want to get yourself a, a resource book, a concordance, um, a topical Bible, something like that, so you can look up all the verses and the passages that relate to the, the topic that you're studying. And this is a great way to understand uh, broader teachings and to teach yourself what the Bible says. And this was one of the favorite ways I had when I first got saved. I had a lot of questions. I didn't know a lot of things. And so I used my topical Bible, just looked up different topics like prayer or whatever, and researched all that that topical Bible had on it and gained myself the knowledge of what God's Word was actually saying about that topic. And over the last few years, my favorite way to study the Bible has been by words. And I made Strong's exhaustive concordance, my friend. I'd look up a word in, inside a passage of Scripture. Maybe I had read that verse and a word popped up. So I would take the concordance and run that verse through every Scripture that I could find that had that word. I'd look for the original meaning so that I knew exactly what the Bible was trying to say. Because sometimes the translators use words that are, and if you're using King James sometimes, you find words that were uh, used back then that aren't used now. And even today, as they translate into new versions, you want to make sure that you're getting the right idea. So, for example, like the word conversation doesn't mean to talk when you read it in the King James. It means a, may, a way of life. So you want to look at the original meaning of the word and make sure you've got the right context there. And then I would always go back and look at some commentators. Um, I've always liked Matthew Henry. I actually kind of grew up on Matthew Henry. Nice old old book, but he's solid and he's got some really good stuff in there. Albert Barnes and W.E. Vines, they're really good ones if you're doing word study. But um, you make yourself some notes, you develop an idea, and God begins to teach you more of what his word is saying. Some of the books in the Bible have actually recurring words. If you're looking at Philippians, the word joy is there many times. If you're looking at the book of John, he talks about believing. Uh, the book of Hebrews talks about the word better. And in, um, what is it? Let me see. Ezekiel. It's Ezekiel where there's a phrase. And I've got it marked every time as I read through the book of Ezekiel, I come across this phrase. You shall know that I am the Lord. It's a great phrase that follows all the way through the book of Ezekiel. So, Words are a great way to look, study your Bible, but whatever word you choose or whatever method you want to enjoy, the real secret to study is application. You heard that before, haven't you? Application, ap application, application. It's no good knowing all this stuff about the Bible unless you apply it to your life because study is like a marinade or, or a spice rub. It needs time to sink in. So don't rush through a study. Don't think because you ran a word one day that you're finished. Take your time to meditate, to pray over it, to wait for God to show you more of what that means and take as long as you need so you can get all that you can out of your study and let it become something that you long for a flavor that's really going to linger in your life and you'll find that what God does is he'll bring to remembrance the verses that you've read as you go and look at the Bible later in other ways you're oh I, I remember studying that oh I know how that relates now and you start to get a really good picture of what your Bible means and then you've got really something to feed upon nowadays my study uh, tends to take a few direct paths. I might be studying to write or to teach, and, and I gain a lot from that, but study done like this is not the type that we're talking about. You need study that feeds you personally. Another way I study is to find answers for people, but you know, counseling as well demands that you study and you gain from that, but again, it's not a private meal for your nourishment. You're going to give that meal away. So you want to make sure that you're studying for your own personal benefit, not just to feed other people. So what am I finding that works for me more now? I'm finding now that as I read my Bible, I stop and look at the phrases or the words that come up to me and I keep them in my journal. So I thought maybe the best way to maybe talk to you a little bit today about how I'm finding study is to just kind of refer to my journal here a little bit and show you kind of what I do. So the other day I started reading 2 Corinthians and things started popping up and so I began to uh, write in my journal the things that I was seeing. So I'm just going to kind of share directly from my journal back and forth a little bit if you can follow me. So I wrote, I began 2 Corinthians today and loads of things popped up in my study and so I listed them. Verse 8, 
it says pressed out of measure. I must have noticed that verse because I was feeling pressured that day. And you know, we face a lot of pressure, don't we? Even subconscious pressures, pressure right now. And we can be pressed out of measure. I even saw a word that I'm going to go back and it, where I read some way, someplace, and they would separated the word measure, M-E-A dash sure. And sure, I've got to go back and look at that one some more too. But it wasn't in my journal that day. I noted verse 9 where it says, trust not in yourselves. And I'm going to come back to that one because that was one that I took time to study out in relation to something else that the God had shown me a few weeks before. I noted the verse uh, 12, the word simplicity. And I'm going to be talking about the spice of simplicity. So I want to come back to that one later. Make note and study out that word some more. I noted verses 21 and 22 where it talks about Christ establishes, God anoints, and the Holy Spirit seals. And there's a three-point sermon right there. If I only had a poem, it'd be just fine. And in verse 24, I made note of the phrase, helpers of your joy. And then I wrote, I think this is my study for today. So I put my journal down and I went and got me some books. I got Strong's and Vines and Matthew, Henry and Barnes and a few others. And I began to take some of these phrases through the resource books and through the uh, examples that I could find and to understand a little bit more of what these verses were saying. So I wanted to share with you kind of now what I've kind of come to. I started with the uh, not trust in ourselves of verse 9 and immediately there was a little passage of uh, scripture, a little teeny tiny thing that I had caught back when I read Matthew 18 that had stayed with me for weeks. I'd thought on it, I'd meditated on it, I'd prayed about it, but I hadn't researched it. So let me write, uh, read for you what I wrote in my journal. Verse 9 reminded me of Luke 18.11, a little phrase that says, prayed thus with himself. And this is the story of the Pharisee and the publican as they come to pray. And it says that the Pharisee prayed thus with himself. This had caught my attention, and I'd meditated and prayed about this for several weeks, and today I needed to study out. But what did it mean that the Pharisee prayed with himself? Was I ever guilty of praying with myself, talking to myself instead of talking with God? Was that what the phrase meant? It actually had me concerned that I could think I was praying and just be talking to myself. And here's what I recorded in my journal after a bit of study. I came to Matthew Henry's uh, explanation of Luke uh, 1811 and here's what he wrote he the Pharisee was only intent upon himself and had nothing in his eye but self not God's glory here is not one word of prayer in all that he saith he went up to the temple to pray but forgot his errand I like that he forgot his errand he thought he had need of nothing no not the favor and grace of God which it would seem he did not think worthy asking. Isn't that amazing? This man went up to the temple to pray and forgot what he was there for and began to tell God all the wonderful things about himself. And that's what that phrase means. He's praising himself. And so I wrote, did God hear his words? Obviously, for God gives the judgment of two prayers. Humility justifies. Pride is abased. As Matthew Henry puts it, it makes one a rival with God. So my devotional study on the phrase prayed with himself was prompted by what I had read in 2 Corinthians 9, not to trust in ourselves. And that's what study does. It helps us link things together. So when 2 Corinthians now tells me not to trust in myself, I have another outlook, another way to look at it, to, to look at the outlook of pride in prayer. And it brings a deeper flavor and a richer spice to my meal. I won't long forget that, will I? Because I've taken time to study that out. So how would I apply this to my life? Because application is the important thing. It reminds me to be careful about my prayer, to think, am I praying to myself, bragging about myself, crying so much about myself, or am I actually talking to God, asking his favor, seeking his mercy? Which way do my prayers go? It's a really good test. You know, I don't want to be a rival with God because I'm so proud of myself. It's a really good thought. It brings me back even then to go back and study more about prayer. Was there anybody else that came to the temple to pray and forgot his errand? You see how study will link you and help you to study further. My journal also recorded phrase, uh, 
uh, thoughts on the phrase helpers of joy in 2 Corinthians chapter 1 and verse 24. And I remember the brightness of this phrase and I thought, what a cute t-shirt would, would that be? Helpers of your joy. Be great for a church staff t-shirt, wouldn't it? They are helpers of your joy. Well, here's what I wrote in my journal. We are servants ministering light and love to those in our care, helping them to find the same joy that we know in Christ and the gifts of Philippians 2, 1 and 2, which is consolation, comfort, and fellowship. And so that, according to Philippians 2, 17, 18, we might rejoice together. So you see how it took the verses in 1 Corinthians and moved me all the way to Philippians as I looked for this idea of helpers of your joy. What do we give if we're helping others to find their joy? We help them to find Christ, don't we? Help them to find his consolation and his love. And then we become workers together. We can rejoice together in what God has done. So study helps us to weave God's word together. It brings things to remembrance. It increases our faith. It's a good thing. And one word or phrase can be used by the Spirit to move you to all kinds of places and give you the taste of yet another morsel and give you a whole meal. And it's a beauty that will draw us back for more. And then there was a little prayer that I recorded. Lord, may I be a helper of joy. Use me to encourage, to plant hope, to bring closer to your love and fellowship those who are hurting and astray. You know, a prayer is a good thing to record. It reminds you of what your heart is thinking about, how God has spoken to you, and it places you with the idea of that you're going to apply now what you have learned. So these two little records of study still rejoice my heart, and my journal is just full of things like this, and every time I go back and read, I'm reminded of the wonderful times of study and fellowship and prayer that I've had in God's Word, looking for treasure, digging things out, and applying things to my life to make it richer. So let me encourage you. Start with a study that encourages or interests you. Get yourself a topical Bible. You can access, access them for free online nowadays. Uh, learn how to use Strong's Exhaustive Concordance. And that way you can double check the, check the meanings and make sure you're keeping your thinking in the right way. And get you some type of a commentary. I learned on Matthew Henry. He's really basic and I love the way he words things. And you can access his commentary online as well. But with those three tools, a topical Bible, a concordance, and some type of commentary that you like, you can learn a lot and consistently feed yourself some most wonderful meals and grow in Christ. So while we're under a lot of these restrictions still, while 2020 is still not done, you have time to do some of these things. Let me tell you as well, while you're away from the consistent um, feeding of your church family, from fellowship, and it's really important then that you take time to feed yourself. You know, it's uh, the time that you spend, um, how can I say this? Let me say it the right way. Even watching Zoom, <laughs> even... Um, watching live stream, these kind of things, they're, they're fine. Uh, but you're, you're eating what someone else has prepared. You want to prepare a meal for yourself. You want God to speak to you personally. And he will do that in a way you've never dreamed if you will open your Bible and study. You know, there's another reason that you should do this. And the reason is because it is a command of God. 2 uh, Timothy chapter 2, verse 15 says, Study. That's it. Study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. The Bible talks about going back and checking what, what you're being told according to God's word. Study. We are responsible ourselves to study God's word, to apply it to our lives, and to make sure that we're rightly dividing the word of God and growing in Christ. Well, I'll see you here again next week. So meanwhile, pick up your Bible Feed yourself a good meal, learn something new each day, and study for your benefit. And I'll see you next week. Bye.